going to talk about a couple of different things, including resiliency, product market fit, things of that nature, and how that has fit into Danny's story along the way. I have some questions here, but we're going to have open Q&A after the fact. So if there's anything that you're like, oh my gosh, I absolutely have to ask this, write it down and you will absolutely have an opportunity to ask that once we're kind of done with our bit. Sound good? Yeah. Beautiful. Let's start this off easy, because like that was a little stressful. So now, <sighs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We're not timing you for these ones. So uh, tell us about Taste and See. How did that come about? Well, Taste and See and Cinders. Yeah. Um, well, two different stories. Uh, Taste and See. Uh, I moved here in 2012 to do the Bethel School of uh, Ministry. And I moved in with a friend who is now my current uh, business partner and very close friend. And we, uh, we were living together and we were just, to be honest, we were complaining about how there weren't good places to eat. And it kind of fell right into, well, what about ice cream? Um, I had a friend in Los Angeles that I did high school with, and during that time was an ice cream renaissance. People were doing all of that craft ice cream with natural, good, good ingredients. And he was working at Spago's, uh, which is a very high-end Wolfgang Puck's restaurant. And he was selling it on the side, and people loved it. People loved this ice cream. So when I said, how about ice cream to my friend, he was like, I don't know about a thing about ice cream. And I said, I have no idea either, but we felt something in the room, maybe we call it a God moment, and we just felt like, whoa, like, I think there's like a light bulb that just kind of clicked off. And uh, one thing led to another, and we went to, I'm oh, sorry, should I be talking? <laughs> 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 one th uh, one <laughs> thing led to another, and we uh, did something at the Bethel Bazaar, now they call it the Christmas market, and we were put in the corner of a room uh, where it's like the most obscure, nobody goes there. Um, and when we started, we were like, we're not going to sell a thing. Um, and my, fr oh, I should backtrack. My friend, we reached out to him and he came up just to help us and just kind of gave us some recipes and said, here, let me go with you. So we did this Bethel market and about 30 minutes in, a line starts to form. And then we had a line for the remaining six hours of the whole market. It was wrapping around out the door all the way through the main halls. And people were asking us, where's your shop? Where are you guys? And we're like, uh, we don't, yeah, we don't have a shop. Um, n one thing led to another. Uh, a friend connected us with the Mount Shasta Mall. Um, they just transferred ownership, and the guy there was, uh, yeah, he just happened to meet my friend, and they had a unit in the food court where right now it's Ulta Beauty uh, for some of the newer people here. Um, but before it was a food court, and we got a lease there. Um, we actually went there. Uh, to the business meeting with the, the person in charge with a ice cooler, two pints of ice cream, and two spoons. And I remember walking in there, super unprofessional, we had no idea what we are doing. Walk in there and we're like, here you go. And the guy's like, oh, cute. And I don't even think he tried the ice cream, but he gave us a lease and, and uh, took a risk on us. And so that's kind of how Taste and See in a Nutshell started. And for Cinders, we acquired it in 2018 or 2019 of December. The previous owner was, he just didn't have a passion for it anymore. So it was being run by a bunch of 20 year olds and they had no passion for business. Uh, and it was, it, they were closing the shop early and the owner who's a friend of ours said, if you guys don't buy it, I'm shutting it down. And so we were kind of forced into it, or, or <laughs> handcuffed, and we're like, yeah, pizza, how hard can it be? Um, it, it, it turned out really hard, but. <laughs> <laughs> Today included in that. <laughs> Today, <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how uh, we acquired Cinders and became this one-two punch for us. That's awesome. So how would you say that like adding, adding that pizza aspect to taste and see, <laughs> How did that like impact your business? Did you see like, oh wow, there's actually like a ton of people that are interested in this pizza side of things too and stuff like how, how would you say that has impacted it over the past, what, six years? Yep. Um, five years? It, yeah, five years. It, it actually, it's, it's kind of our saving grace because the pizza does a lot more revenue than the ice cream itself, uh, just naturally because of higher price points and such. And ice cream, whether, even though we're in the second sunniest city in America, it has, uh, during the winter season, it's, it's 
a loss leader. Um, so having that pizza really stabilized our business. Um, so we're not taking these huge losses um, right when it hits winter time. Um, so that was actually a huge strategic move that we had no plans of making. <laughs> nice. So how, how did you like identify the market need specifically for ice cream when you got started? Or was it more just like, oh, this would be an interesting thing to do? Like, what did you do to figure out like, oh, yes, this would be a good fit here in Reading? Other than 100 plus degree weather, <laughs> and uh, there's that. <laughs> there that, and then like I said, sun, second sunniest city. Uh, when, I, believe it or not, the only ice cream shop at the time when we launched this in 2015 was Cold Stone Creamery. There were no other ice cream shops. And I just thought that was the most bizarre thing in the world um, because, like I said, this is prime, a prime city to have one. Uh, so when we started this, we, we kind of knew like, oh, people want more ice cream. I, Cold Stone Cream, nothing wrong with it, uh, but it isn't really the healthiest ice cream. They use, they use a lot of corn syrup, they use uh, artificial flavorings and things of that sort. And during that time, 2015, I think there was a movement that was happening with a lot of health consciousness. And we kind of like rode on the, the coattails of that and said, well, it's happening in LA. It's happening in San Francisco. It's happening in Portland. Why don't we bring it here? Nice. Did you guys do anything else besides besides like the bazaar and then getting into the mall? Like, did you do any other pop-ups to be like, hey, like, was this a fluke or like, do people really want this? When we initially started in the mall, we just popped up in the mall. We just went for it. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was bold and the well, it was it was a learning lesson because a lot of Reading locals. They weren't accustomed to these bizarre flavors. So when we had like maple syrup, candy bacon, they looked at, they would stare at, like, stare at me. That is say, in the back too right now, the maple bacon, or at least it was when we started this, so. Okay, there, it was here, it was. <laughs> yeah, they didn't, uh, they, they weren't really fond of it. They, they were very hesitant uh, and we had to build trust. Um, when they, they just wanted their vanilla, chocolate, strawberry. Um, and I think that was, uh, yeah, that was a bit of that challenge. Um, yeah. So how is it that you like then, say, wanted to do innovation with flavors, but also keep, you know, like the norms for people? Like how, how do you balance that? Yeah. And, and I'm so sorry, I didn't answer the last question. We didn't do it. Yeah, we didn't do any of the things. Oh yeah, no, you're good. Um, how do we balance that? We have just recently done an ice cream rotation. So every month we're putting out a brand new ice cream first of the month kind of like a, a sneaker drop, but we call it our flavor drop. Um, that has helped us give a bit of creative space to kind of play around and put stuff out that actually has been horrible. Um, we had an olive oil ice cream that, yeah, it's, it's funny, yeah. It's, but uh, it's, there is a friend in town who's executive chef, he, that's his favorite flavor. But when we came out, it it's the worst selling flavor, <laughs> um, and and so we have that space, and and we kind of play around and, and just dabble with that, and we're always keeping about two to three uh, ice creams um, that just have kind of that creative edge, and then we have our staples. We haven't changed for like years. Mm -hmm. If you get rid of the peanut butter, uh, peanut butter pretzel sesame one, I, I can, yeah, I can't promise you anything. <laughs> Okay, so then I'm just gonna have to go buy it in bulk just in case. It's like Trader Joe's. I'm like, oh no, it's here for a week. Buy it all. Like, I love that one. I love it. So that one, my, uh, this is one of my favorite ones right now. That peanut butter pretzel sesame one. So uh, whoever's in charge of those decisions, just bear that in mind. Like, I will be sad if it leaves. So, so has there been a specific risk that you took that ended up paying off way more than you expected it to? I would say opening up the Hilltop location was a huge risk. Uh, just naturally, it's only three miles away from this location. And probably any business or retail owner will tell you that is, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Um, when we opened, we cannibalized about 20% of our sales. And that hurt uh, because we put a lot of money into it. We thought we were gonna do coffee, we had a drive through Coffee is a beast on its own, just to let you know. Um, there are a lot of challenges to that. Uh, people may know us for great ice cream, but even if we serve amazing coffee, it just, it's really hard to bridge that gap. 
uh, in the consumer uh, mentality. And so when we opened that, it, it was definitely hard, but now today it's actually eclipsed our market sales. Um, it's become the place where people want to go. Um, I, I think for the um, environment, there's no pizza, it's just ice cream, it's more inviting and friendly and welcoming. So how did you crack the egg on staying open till 11? Yeah. Um, wow, you know, answering these questions, a lot of it sounds like it comes from frustrations. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's business sometimes, yeah. like. <laughs> uh, we were, you know, we're students at school, and we were really frustrated, Jake and I, because there's nowhere to go in town after 9 p.m. It was horrible, like, unless you go to a bar, and that's not, you know, a bar's a bar. Uh, so when we opened Taste and See, we're like, we are staying open till 11. This is gonna be our hangout. And we were single then. Um, so uh, we're like, this is the hangout. And, but once we did it, it just became part of, I think, our DNA. And, uh, and yeah, we try not to steer from that, so. Oh yeah, 100%. So what would you say there, like what key indicators have told you that Taste and See has really like achieved a good product market fit? Maybe back in like 2017 or something like that, that you're like, oh wow, this is gonna work. Yeah. Um, the lines, that was, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible sight to see, especially after those, yeah, when you work so hard and you see people come in and just loving your ice cream, it is one of the best feelings in the world. Um, and uh, I think also, I think brand collaborations. Um, so I don't know if you know, but we have been supplying Mosaic with our ice cream uh, for quite some time now, and they make their own fully composed dessert off of our ice cream. Uh, we also partnered with Turtle Bay to do their 20th um, anniversary. We did a specific flavor for them in conjunction with them. And uh, we also do, we were also selling Theory Coffee ice cream when we first launched. Um, and for me, that's that's high compliment. Because if another company is willing to partner with us to do brand collabs, that says that they value us, they respect us, and they think our product is amazing. Um, and Turtle Bay Mosaic, I mean, these are these guys are a staple to writing, so we took that as, as a way like we made a fit. Oh, definitely, definitely. So how have, it, how have you measured business success outside of like financial numbers? So like outside of just the yeah. numbers thing, how, is there anything that you guys are like, oh yeah, like this, this means success, success to us? It's a, it's a great question. Um, it's, I think for me, success has, it's, it's transformed over the years. Because uh, when you first launch, success to me is, it's numbers, it's bottom line. Are we paying our bills? Are the lights on? Can we, uh, are we getting by to the next stage? Um, then it became, uh, I think, expanding. Do we need to expand? And, and my whole focus and energy was like, we need to expand. That's how we know we're successful, right? We got two locations. Uh, but I'm thinking about this, and I think success now, it actually, we measure it kind of how by our culture. And what I mean by that is, this might sound cliche, but it's the truth. Uh, we could not have done all of this without our staff. And I mean it, because our staff is the face, they're the day to day, and they get to carry the experience. Uh, something we tell all the time to our staff is, we, we may have the best ice cream in Reading, we may have one of the best pizzas, but we do not want to be known for that. We want to be known for the customer experience. Um, yeah, but a favorite quote of mine is by Maya Angelou. She says, people don't remember how, what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And that has been, a, that has been the staple. And so our, a metric we know is employee retention rate. I don't know if you know this, but in the restaurant industry, it is the turnover rate is 80% within a year. It, it, that's, that's the average. Um, our employee retention rate is about two years. Um, and most of the time it's because they're students and stuff, but we take that and we understand that as, oh, we've created a place where they feel valued. We created a place where they love to work and most importantly, they're having fun. And when that happens, I think that just translates to numbers. It, it always does. Because the customers feel it. They actually say, they come into the place and they say, man, this place is so amazing. Everyone's having so much fun here. Your staff look like they're having a great time. And I think that 
to me is is a huge success now at this point of our stage. Oh, 100%, mm -hmm. absolutely. So can you describe a time when you had to pivot a product or a strategy to say better meet what the market wanted? And you can't say getting rid of the olive oil ice cream because you've already said that, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, uh, probably dietary restrictions. Um, uh, when we started coming out with gluten-free ice cream, uh, vegan ice cream, uh, that wasn't a thing. It was around 2017, around that time, just like you're saying. And that was just the beginnings of it. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but not a, everyone was looking for that. So we actually kind of went ahead of the curve and we came up with two flavors that were dairy-free, vegan and gluten-free, and we started marketing it as such. And people loved it. They, they were very thankful. And same with the pizza side, we did cauliflower crust, we did gluten-free crust and vegan cheese, and all of that made a difference. Uh, a lot of travelers coming down to I-5, they have a lot of dietary restrictions um, and so forth. So it, it, yeah, we saw the impact right away. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So then what strategies have you implemented to make taste and see a year-round business? So, you know, you can even think more so maybe at Hilltop because like here at this one you have cinders, which as you had mentioned, that brings in people for the pizza and it's like, oh, I'm here, I should get ice cream too. But like basically how do you get people in the door year-round at an ice cream store? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, we, we do a lot of marketing. We, a lot of times, restaurant or food service, it's impulse. Uh, if they don't see you on social media or marketing, it's not that they don't care about it, they don't want your product, they just forget. And, and when I say forget, like weekly forget. So we're constantly doing social media, we're constantly sending out emails just to kind of nudge and say, hey, we're still here, we're not going anywhere, hey, f remember us. And on top of that, we do events throughout the whole year um, uh, to try to uh, keep getting the people into the door, um, such as we do our Mother's Day, Father's Day giveaway. Um, that's something that's actually sentimental to us, uh, to me and Jake. Um, Cause uh, yeah, for me, I lost my mom. Um, and the day we opened in Market Street was actually her anniversary, a death anniversary. And for Jake, he lost his father. Um, and so we wanted to do something special, but I think having that kind of tradition and those components of saying like, hey, we're not just here to, we just don't want to just grow and take money, money. Like we really want to give back and be part of this community has really translated into trust with the community. So. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So when has there been an experience where you say you maybe faced a business adversity or some type of challenge and how did you overcome that? So like speaking to that resiliency side of things. Just a preface, she gave me these questions beforehand to kind of, but uh, I, and I say that because I thought about how to answer this and how transparent and vulnerable did I want to go. Um, but I think I'm just going to just come right out and say, uh, because, so I'll just go with it. it when we pr decided to go to Anderson, we purchased a building next to Maverick's gas station right off of North Street. And we purchased a building. It was supposed to be our production facility slash the other side restaurant space for pizza and ice cream. Um, production facility as in we were making it in Duvenvorden Farms and Cottonwood, and we wanted to bring it all in-house. Um, when we did that, the, we met with our architects. It was months and months of planning, and we did not really know and understand how construction worked. Um, or we, yeah, and we, it ballooned. The project ballooned. The project ended up, when we, in the middle of it, we said, we need a bid on this. It turned into a two million plus project. And we bought the building for $400,000. So we took a step back and to, I am, there's no way in heck I'm putting $2 million into a $400,000 building. That just sounds ludicrous to me. And, um, and the payments itself, when we tried to, when we broke down the schedule, if anything happened, it would have sank our whole business. And so we knew we're, we're in a situation where we're like, what do we do? Um, and th th let me tell you, we, with the engineers and architects, we put in almost $100,000 of our cash. That, it, ooh, even when I say it, I get, I, it hurts still. Um, 
I say that because, man, I dealt with so much shame, so much embarrassment as a business owner. Uh, I felt like the dumbest person in the world. I'm like, how can you just burn $100,000 like that on blueprints? Um, and not ask the questions along the way, you know? It's, it's so many what ifs. Like, if I had done this better, if I had done that, maybe I would have, you know, I would have been able to hit that exit button. Um, and so we ended up uh, pulling out of the project. The bank told us, hey guys, and this was in 2023 when the market, the interest rate started skyrocketing. So now we're stuck with this building and, we're, and the bank's like, well, uh, how about if we just do restaurant? Because the production is what was killing us, right? And they said no, because it doesn't make sense on paper. We needed those metrics to do that. And so we're like, okay, so what are our options? And they said, well, going to have to put on the market, and if not, you're going to have to short sell this. And we were like, oh my gosh, right? Like double whammy. Um, but we put on the market, and in a month, we, <laughs> this is like, this must be God, because it got sold for cash for 40000 over our buying price. So we, we, it, we didn't make everything back, because, you know, Uncle Sam gets his portion. Um, but we definitely mitigated some of that loss. And um, after that, we said, okay, we're done with Anderson. We're not going there. Um, but an opportunity arose with the building we're at right now. And the beauty of it is that it was so much better as far as like the ambiance. The, it was more communal because there's outside patio seating. The inside is just so bright. And, and it was a fraction of the cost. Um, the build out. Um, so we decided to launch there. And because of that, and I, I share all this to say like opportunities come in such different ways and we couldn't have planned this. But because of that launch and just seeing that whole process, we recently actually, last week had a meeting with the CEO of one of the largest developers here in this, in this county. And they are, they are doing a very large project and basically gave us a silver platter deal. So we're putting in a letter of intent. This is kind of, this is the first of it, so it's kind of a hush-hush thing, but we're putting a letter of intent for next year. Um, don't want to divulge names and stuff, but, uh, but yes, that wouldn't have happened unless that Anderson, we kept continuing in that route. That was a wild story, yeah. And I, I would say, even just speaking to you personally as well, I went in this morning to Cinder's to find, because we were going to get you Cinder's pizza. Like, that was the intent. But uh, to find out that both of the HVAC units had gone uh, at your location, it was like, stores closed today. I was like, <gasps> of all the days. And so, but the way how you handled it with such grace, it's like, well, yeah, it happens. You know, <laughs> so... Uh, anyways, just speaking to, to that, that I, uh, yeah, you carried yourself well in even those situations. So is there anything that you would say to, you know, entrepreneurs, business owners on this, this wasn't one of the questions here. So, uh, but anyways, anything that you would say that it's like that you, that you have found helpful in like getting you in that right headspace for when those rains do come in business? Like, so speaking to that resiliency side of things, like. Is it just a learned skill for you, or is there anything that you do specifically that kind of like helps you through those things or through those moments? Um, can I just say, if I can do this, and let me tell you, I, had, I am anxious, I get a lot of anxiety, I get stressed out pretty easily. Um, as calm as I may try to appear right now, let me tell you, inside my world is like, oh my gosh, our two AC units blew out. We gotta close the shop. How long is it gonna be? We're gonna lose all that income. What are we gonna do? Uh, but if I can do this, I'm telling you, anyone can do it. I, I mean it. Um, sometimes, what's helped me is, you just don't have another option. You just gotta keep going. <laughs> like, that, that's the truth. You're just like, all right, if I, if I turn around, that, like, it's, it's a cliff. <laughs> so, <laughs> either I die right now, or I can prolong my death. <laughs> and, and, but, but something happens and people come out of the, the woodworks and, and hands and people save you from things. And so, yeah, I would say um, having uh, just, just trusting the process. Um, 
Um, <laughs> you guys ever heard the Mike Tyson quote? Everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Yep. That, is, that is the truest quote. At, and, and let me tell you, I am a planner and I've planned, I'm like, oh, this is how it's gonna look. Anderson's gonna be this, this is how we're gonna set up. I've got it down to the T. Uh, that plan goes out the window real quick. Um, it, it just becomes more like a guideline or like it, it just kind of maybe bumper rails, but, um, and for me, it's learning how to pivot. And I think that was a learned and acquired skill. Um, you just got to pivot. And uh, that's something I think I've gotten really good at is saying when I hit a wall, I'm like, okay, we're going to make this thing work or I'm going to go around it. And yeah, as long as, as long as you don't give up, it's not failing. Right. One of the things uh, Eric and I like to say, so about two summers ago, we were like, oh yeah, we're gonna be whitewater kayakers, definitely, like this is gonna work. It did not work, like at all. We like did it twice, and I was like, I have never wanted to throw up before so much as I do right now, because I hate this. But what we would always tell ourselves is like, be the stick, because like when we were sometimes like scoping out things, we're like, how should we do this? We'd like chuck a stick into the river and like watch how that floated through. And we're like, okay, maybe that's kind of the path. Like this will work. And like there were times we were like going through these these tough waters, literally yelling, "Be the stick," you know. And like as we're navigating these channels, so that kind of ties in there of like just be the stick. So and then the sticks would always make it out, you know. And make it out on the other side, so. Yeah, but uh, I think the sticks experienced a little bit less anxiety than we did on some of those little rapids. We're like, oh my gosh. So last question for me, then we'll turn it over to everybody else here. So in what ways have you kind of adapted your business practices to say like ensure long-term stability or like having that plan for like, like how to plan out that long-term stability? I think there's a few things that we're trying to do right now is, well, one thing, we did everything backwards. Uh, what I mean by that is when you do ice cream shops, usually the, you, the legal law for California dairy is you can make it in the shop and you can sell it out of the shop. But the moment you have a second shop and you want to deliver it to it, you can't do that. You have to make it out of that shop and sell it. That's a logistical nightmare. So we love to do things the hard way, me and Jake. So we actually did the production facility first, put all that money into that with one shop. Uh, but what it's done to us is we, we've recently moved out of Duvenboard and Farms, and which was like a 300 square foot kitchen, and we are in the old Pizza Hut building right there on Hilltop. So we moved into a 3,000 square foot production facility. Uh, that was a game changer because we got a machine that does three or double what our current machine does. So we're doing three times the volume of ice cream in the same amount of time. Um, that's a tremendous amount of labor saving costs. So with this production, we're also transitioning to do all of our pizza sauces there and potentially dough production and then just have it delivered because they're already making deliveries already. So all that does is it's, it's making it easy for us to open up new shops because it's one, it's cheaper, and two, it's not more labor cost. It actually reduces our overhead because of this production facility. And three, um, yeah, it streamlines everything so we have consistency and all that. So, so. so if what I'm hearing is that you're making double the amount of ice cream you could, so there's no reason why the peanut butter pretzel sesame flavor should disappear. <laughs> is, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. yeah, you got me. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. I'll just play that back if ever it disappears. I'll be like, hey, remember that one time when you spoke at the event? Where'd it go? Anyways, thank you so much uh, for, for being vulnerable, for sharing your experience and your insight and knowledge that I treasure that time. So thank you so much. And, oh, of course, of course. And now, now I'm gonna turn it over to these guys so they all didn't send you the questions beforehand. So anyway, who has, oh, okay, great. Hey Danny, thanks for talking today. Just like ice cream, uh, my business, Outdoor Recreation, is a pretty seasonal business and there's a lot of first year businesses here. What can we expect with the seasonality come August, September and what's your experience with dealing with that? I know you touched on it a little bit, but I'd love to hear some more. Uh, Labor Day, that's the marker for us. 
Uh, once Labor Day hits, everything changes because kids are back in school. Um, the temperature starts to drop, and so from there we start to plan our decline. Um, and I think, did you say how do we, how do you kind of uh, plan ahead for that? Yeah. Yeah, and as you know, yeah, Reading is a uh, tourist place. It's a that's our biggest industry here in town, one of the biggest. And so in the winter time, it kind of hunkers down. Um, but uh, but what we do get is you still get a lot of I five traffic that they stop in Reading because this is the last place before Oregon, realistically, like as in major city. Um, and so you can plan on um, being more local. Um, that would be kind of my answer to that. Hey, Danny, thanks. So you said um, in the wintertime, ice cream is a loss leader. Do you think it's the same for Baskin Robbins and Cold Stone? Are they losing money during the winter? If yes, if it's just ice cream, the only thing I can think of that would prevent that is their cakes. Interesting. Um, because that is right. Um, but yes. So have you guys thought of expanding into like something that would get you through the winter easier? Yeah, we try coffee. That didn't really yeah. stick well. <laughs> uh, uh, we we have. We're actually to we're actively um, having discussions every season of how do we boost up sales in that regard. Gotcha. Hey, uh, I have a question. We we own uh, the drum school, and uh, our question is, you know, we we have a plan of expanding, opening up our second location, and uh, what, what what when you guys did that, what is the is there a metric you use? I mean, is it like through a demand? You know, we have a lot of interest in, in, in Chico, uh, possibly Sacramento and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's it, it's a lot to take on what we have right, right now. So what, what metric would you use as, you know, as your uh, business grows to open up a second place? It seems good and terrifying at the same time, right? If you're at a place where you are considering a second one, that's that's a incredible place to be. So congratulations, um, because it means you are seeing uh, a success in your current location. Um, I'd say it's it's not the metrics itself that like you can do some market research like demographic. Um, does it fit kind of like who our clientele and customer base is? Um, but at that point. Um, it, I think for us, we always knew if we opened up another place, it would make money because I think we just believe in our product. Um, so for us, it was it had to make sense. So let me break down. In the in the restaurant industry, it's supposed to be 25% food costs, 25% labor, 25% overhead, and 25% margins. It's not like that anymore because of inflation. It's all over the and California labor wages. Um, so we try to make sure we can build that in and knowing that 25%, like how long is it going to take us to recoup that amount of investment um, in the build out um, because it's a significant cost for restaurants. Um, and as long as we can make it back within those three years, I think we feel confident that we can keep going and depending on the lease that you're negotiating to. Hi, Danny. I'm Tim from Mama Sherry's Kombucha. I was interested to hey, understand Tim. how you overcame the regulatory requirements to not transport made ice cream. Uh, that was the, the backwards story. Uh, we, it, so we actually are under the CDFA. Uh, we're not regulated by the health department here in Shasta County for the production facility only um, because the CDA, we have a milk dairy plant license. Uh, I know it sounds fancy, but it just means we're producing a lot of volume of milk products or ice frozen products. And so our production with that license, we can technically, we're selling it to ourselves. That's how the state of California sees it. Um, and so having that production is how we're able to supply every store versus replicating it in each, Thank you, you know, selling it out of that or making out of that. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I had a question. Uh, opening up a pizzeria in Reading when it's oversaturated with pizzerias like Mod Pizza, Papa Murphy's, Domino's, Pizza Hut, 
Uh, can you talk a little bit about how did your competitor, uh, competitive analysis went, like do, knowing that you're opening up a restaurant that is going to be directly in line with, you know, maybe a dozen others? <laughs> I wish we did some kind of analysis. <laughs> Does, does, does feeling count as analysis or, or, or just ignorance? I think ignorance might be the right one. Uh, but I, I appreciate the compliment of it. Uh, the, no, when we bought, when we took over the pizza place, uh, we were, when, we say, when I said handcuffed, it means taste and see on that side does not have a, a dish pit uh, or kitchen. So we actually piggybacked off of the Cinder's Pizza dish pit kitchen. So if they went out of business, we had no way of staying in business. Uh, so when he, he offered it to us pretty much, again, on a silver platter asset sale, we said, we looked at, the main thing we looked at was customer sentiment. And what was interesting is they had 300 Yelp reviews at four and a half stars, but nobody knew about Cinder's Pizza. It was all the people traveling on the I-5. So we knew, and you know, I eat the pizza too when we're working there, and we thought it was good. And the fact that it was wood fired, nobody did wood fired in, in this town. We're like, okay, there are a couple of factors that are going for us. And so that plus ignorance and, and just <laughs> really. Thank you, Danny, for your time. Um, so for my future businesses, uh, I'll be leasing the property. And so I'm not sure if you guys lease it or own the pro both properties. But I want to see what's your, what's your outlook on doing that and what's your approach? Are you trying to get the longest term lease or you simply just buy the property out? That's a great question because that's something that we're always considering. So we are in leases for all of our properties because we sold that building, um, but we have intent to own. And the reason being seven years of our lease, one, seven years is pretty much the price of the property. And uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And so we are, with our real estate agent, we are trying to kind of gently say like, hey, we really want to buy these properties when the first leg of the lease is up. And because, yeah, there's no reason for them to have it, especially if we're the ones, the tenants there, and we have plans like, hey, we're going to move somewhere else. So yes, uh, we want to own the properties. Uh, we're trying to. Um, my question is, the hardest times I've ever personally gone through has been business partners, trusting people, the intuition. I'm very um, empathetic. When I lose a business partner, when we go through something, I've noticed that it affects me a lot more than it affects the second party. Um, my question is, how have you dealt with past business partners or just that, like what you said, the intuition that you have. Sometimes you have a really good pis, uh, business partner, but your intuition says, this isn't it, this isn't gonna work. Um, and it's almost like heartbreak. Like the, you know, the biggest heartbreaks I've ever been is a business partner, luckily. I'm really lucky in the you know, um, romantic partner uh, side, but the business partner side is, um, it takes you down, you know, it takes a toll. So my question is, how have you dealt with it? Um, have you just been really lucky to, you know, it sounds like you have an amazing business partner and he's stuck by your side the whole time, but have you ever had a time where that wasn't the case? I have a lot of insight on that because uh, Jake and I, we are really close friends, but we are polar opposites. He is a 6'4 Tennessee and Southern guy that just, I'm, I'm a city slicker from Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, all of our interests, the way we process, do all these things, it's completely different. Um, with that, let me just say, like, but we're like brothers. Um, we almost fist fought over settlers of Canton because I, I could have sworn he was cheating, but he wasn't cheating. Uh, but, I, but that's the reality of it. And I always want to say, if you, when you do business partners, this is just my opinion, you're entering into a marriage. Um, so it's the exact same way. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of communication, a lot of, uh, yeah, you're just going to have to believe in each other and walk through it. It just doesn't work on the basis of paper, you do this, you do that. You can, but it's not going to have that small business feel to it. Um, so if you can plan on, like I, used, I would see Jake more than my wife at periods of, my, of this time, that, that's the truth. Um, and so he knows me exactly inside and out now. 
we've had we've had times where we were going to throw the business, we we're going to sell the business because we hit pl places where we're like, we're just done. I can't work with you. I feel devalued. He felt devalued, and we just couldn't. But one thing that set us apart is we we knew that we're in this for each other first. And we always kept coming back to that commitment, like, hey, if this thing goes south and we lose it all, man, like, I'll still love you as a brother. And um, if you can see it that way and just know your expectations and they having the same expectations, it'll make it a lot easier. One last question here. Who wants it? Thanks for your time, Danny. Um, just curious, man, how much... Um, or what are your uh, advertising methods and what have you found most successful in that regard? Um, uh, some advertising is, a lot of it is social media. Uh, we do email marketing. Um, we've seen that we get like at least 50% of an open rate. Uh, it gives us the metrics on Square. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, paid advertising at some point. So during COVID, we did a lot of uh, Facebook ads and that blew us up. Um, I think because everyone's stuck at home, they had to try new, pr new restaurants, and so they would order it from us, and that kind of just built our following up. Um, so now we have someone just, uh, we do have a marketing manager who really is taking it upon herself to go out there and connect in different creative ways, um, because uh, I think doing events, a lot of events, and uh, like I said, it's all about being in the eye of the community, because um, it, it's we can easily be forgotten, even if we have great ice cream. And I know that I don't think we're like special in any, by any means. So in that sense. <laughs>